Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged, episode number 10, where we continue our conversation with Marty Bergen, president of Don Capital Management. I think, I mean, I think there's certainly a lot of uh, things to be said about, you know, if you can identify the markets that are trending and getting a, a full position, so to speak, in those markets at the same time, not having a full positions in the market and that are stuck in ranges. I mean, I do think that that has a significant impact on, on performance. And that in a sense is very much sort of the, the holy grail of, of what, uh, what we are all trying to do. Yeah. The only thing is you got to be careful. So I agree with you. And I think the, the key there is being able to reduce your positions in the non-trending or your allocation of risk to the non-trending environment. Um, what we do not do is we do not borrow risk from some markets and give it to other markets. So each market is treated with an equal allocation of the risk pie, per se. Now, there will be a lot of markets where we aren't using up the allocation. Of course. But when we're not using it up, we aren't giving it to another market to allow it to take on a whole lot more risk. No, no. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think that's that's why we've survived for 40 years. Um, you know, everybody looks at us and says, my gosh, you all trade at such a high volatility. I don't know if I can handle that. But, you know, we've been doing it for 40 years. And, yeah, we've had our drawdowns in our history. but you know, we've never, you know, we're still here. We're still <laughs> trading and still making new highs. So a Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think this is the other key thing that, you know, uh, often um, I believe investors confuse volatility with risk. And, you know, in my mind, there's a clear distinction between the two and, and you've clearly proven that. So uh, I think that's also an important point to, uh, to take away and does the program simply just run itself it's it there's no other influences on the program and in in terms of uh, uh overrides or, or other inputs no nope, no other inputs whatsoever i mean if uh if a trader was to not execute on one of the trades that the system generated that would be their quickest way out of the door of done <laughs> And, you know, we have very, very low turnover yeah. and, uh, you know, it, it's just understood here sure. that we do, we would never think that we're smarter than the system. Yeah. How, how long time does it actually take to run the system like, uh, you know, like yours? Well, it's all predicated on how good the coding is. We, we can <laughs> run our system today in you know, a number of seconds. Okay. Um, there have been times in the past where it took minutes or a half an hour to run, but it, it really just comes down to how much computing power and how well things are coded. You have this ability to do multi-dimensional calculations in MATLAB and uh, other software programs that allow you to take calculations that would take you know several minutes and do them in one second. So, um, you know, it's just utilizing the resources that have been provided. Sure, sure. Marty, I want to jump 
to another point that I think is really important and and uh, you know I know your experience will be really valuable for many people and and that's the topic of drawdowns um you know a a big part of what a CTA strategy does is is kind of you know being in a drawdown um most of the time and what I'd love to know is a little bit about what you've learned because i i have a feeling that uh, some of the things some of the improvements that you've done over time probably is from the learning experience from being in drawdowns um so i'd love to know what what you've taken away from that and and um you know and also in a sense from a completely different angle the emotional side of being in a drawdown how do you go about balancing that which is very difficult for for many investors. Yeah, well, I'll I'll hit the last part first. <laughs> that was pretty easy. All you had to do is watch Bill Dunn. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, every day is the same. You wouldn't know if we were up a hundred percent or down thirty percent. Okay. I mean, there's no change at all. Uh, the way we view it here is. And I think this is true in any kind of systematic trading. I mean, every day is a new day. Yeah. I mean, this whole adage, oh, well, you've made 40%, you you know, it's got to revert to the mean. No, it doesn't. And if you've lost 30%, it doesn't have to revert to the mean. Each day, it, a new calculation is made, your new positions are taken, and, you know, you start at zero. Yeah. So... Um, I think from an emotional standpoint, you just have to believe in the program you're using. You, in trend following, you have to understand that drawdowns are part of the process. If there weren't drawdowns, then you're not doing trend following. Yeah. It's just by definition, it's part of the process. Now, does that mean that you have to go through a period like we did in, you know, uh, 2002 through 2007, where we lost 60% and had a 50 plus month drawdown, you know, that that's severe and that's significant. Um, you know, I think the only thing that gave us comfort during that phase was there were a lot of people in our industry that were going through the same problem. Sure. And if you remember right, you know, in 2007, early 2007, late 2006, everybody talked about trim falling as being dead. <laughs> and sure. then you had the, you know, 2008, the credit crisis came along. Um, what I think is really significant about our industry during that time frame is every alternative investment class prior to 2008 was viewed as being uncorrelated to the S&P. And they weren't highly correlated. They were, but they were correlated. I mean, every asset class was more correlated to S&P than managed futures. Sure. But when the crisis hit, they all became very correlated. Yeah. Except for the S&P and global macro probably, which became negatively correlated. Yeah. I think the interesting thing that's happened since the crisis, for the five years after the crisis, every one of those alternative investment classes has become more correlated to the S&P than they ever have been in the past. Absolutely. And most people don't realize that. <laughs> now, we have, you know, we're basically zero correlated. I think the CT sp CTA space in general is actually you know, increased its correlation, but it's only up to like 18, 20%. And I think that's because there's a number of CTAs that have given allocations to long equities. Yeah. And that is built into their returns. And because of their size, you know, that number is picked up in the data. No doubt. But, uh, you know, people have to understand what, there's a place for CTAs, even in today's environment where we're not making a lot of money. Um, you know, we're comfortable because we're still making money in this environment. But even if the CTAs aren't making money as a whole, that risk protection 
um, you know, that insurance that could be bought by an allocation to a CTA is significant. And people with large portfolios need to understand that because if something else comes down the pipe, similar to 2008, that's going to be your only safe harbor. I mean, it, the CTAs weren't putting up blocks to getting money out. Uh, the CTAs were liquid and the CTAs were continuing to make money. Um, you know, that's an important thing to remember. Would you say that the drawdowns that you've been through has made you a stronger firm? I mean, not many people would, you know, probably emotionally survive being in a, in a drawdown that you described. Well, I think we're better. We're definitely better because we've learned from it. Yeah. And I think that's something that people, I am not one of these people that thinks just because you have a long history that that makes you better right. than somebody else. But one thing you have to remember is when you're looking at data, somebody, it's easy to have a good sharp ratio if you don't have a long history and you came out at the right time or your system was, you know, was in a good, good market environment for that type of system. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two is you want a CTA that has gone through the drawdown, mm. especially if you're looking at systematic trend following, because the drawdown will occur if it hasn't happened yet. And you don't really know how that CTA is going to react. You know, you probably want to look for somebody who's been through it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's also been very interesting to note. In fact, if uh, if if I look at 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 Dunn compared to other uh, CTAs, is in fact that whilst your drawdown through the difficult time we've been through has actually gone down, most and and it goes to your point, most of the managers who's also been around for at least you know a couple of decades, they saw their drawdowns significantly expand in the last. 12, 18 months. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right about that, that, you know, longevity doesn't mean you're necessarily, you know, uh, you know, better, um, unless you've learned and, and you've made changes. Yeah. I but, mean, yeah. for instance, look at long-term capital. Yeah. I mean, they hadn't gone through a drawdown and they had the, you know, the best pedigree there was in the world. Right. Yeah. But, you know, They've done it twice now. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I, I want to jump, I want to jump to the area of research. Now, um, investors tend to always want people to innovate and do research, but they don't like necessarily change. So how do you, how do you balance that? And, 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 and how do you approach research in general well first off um we have a very dedicated team of guys that are doing a research and it's not a large group um we got four guys that focus on nothing but research and then a number of other guys that are have wear multiple hats they basically provide assistance to the research um the way we approach it is, you know, if you find something better, why wouldn't you implement it? Sure. I mean, it just doesn't make sense not to. With that said, you can't fool yourself into thinking you found something better and you really haven't. And I think that happens a lot in this industry. We make a real effort to make sure that all our research and our development is done in an out of sample type environment. So in other words, we only release certain amount of data for anybody to work on. And then once they come up with something that they think is viable, then we will release more data. And then the other thing we do is we only use data up until a time frame that we're running it through. We never allow for the future data to come in and then we run it forward. So we never give it the data for the given day that it's running to. It's always historical data and we let it run forward. Um, the other thing we do is we have an internal due diligence process where we have uh, Daniel Dunn, which is Bill's son, who graduated, he was in the medical field 
and was doing research at NIH. But he, he's a PhD and an MD, basically. Very intelligent guy. Mm. He's our last line of defense. So when somebody when they got something that they believe is ready to go, then it goes to Daniel and he will tear it apart and determine whether it's real or not. At that point in time, we paper trade it. Of course, that's being done just to make sure that all the operational systems and everything are working. And then once we determine everything's a go, we'll put our own personal money in it first. Sure. And it, under the umbrella of done capital management, it, it may be there for several years uh, before we actually introduce it in anything where outside investors would be exposed to it. Um, I guess from an outside investor standpoint, you can look at it two ways. If it's successful, we're reaping the benefits <laughs> in the early stage. But if it's not successful, they're darn glad we were the ones that were doing it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, it's our money. We're highly unlikely to implement anything that isn't going to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And and if we look at, I mean, that's looking for new things. But if we look at it the other way around, what what might prompt a yellow or red flag, if I can call it that, um, that might indicate maybe that one of the things already inside the uh, the system may not be working as you expected um well we've never had that issue with any of our internal developed okay. stuff um but what we look for and we have had this happen in some of our external or strategic alliances situations where we start looking at when we update the program as to whether parameter selection has any thing to do with actual performance. Is there any correlation between the parameter update versus the actual performance of the system? Or is there a big divergence between performance based on parameter selection? Some of those type of things would give you the idea that there's something wrong, that it really isn't as good as you thought it was. So the risk um, of optimization, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, if you if you picked, you know, one point and then you pick the point very right next to it, and in one case you make 100%, and in the other case you lose 50%, uh, that's a big concern. <laughs> if it's that... Uh, subject to the actual selection process. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, we've had programs that have, that we've stuck with that have lost money over a series a period of time. And we've had programs that have made money over a series of time where we just realized that it just, something happened to it and it doesn't function anymore. Yeah. Um, we haven't had internally, but I think because we focus so hard on our systems to make sure they're robust mm. and they'll work. Our goal is to design systems that are going to work for high capacity over long historical periods of time. Mm. And I, I mean, I know diversification is, you know, very, very important. And sometimes you have markets in your portfolio that, you know, are there for specific reasons in, in, in a sense, but are there some markets or sectors that, that your systems struggle with more than others or over time profit seems to be pretty evenly spread across sectors over the long run? No, nah, there, you know, we don't even view it that way because as long as there's price movements, it just doesn't really matter. Um, so, yeah, there's periods in history where there aren't a lot of trending environments in the price movement of a particular market, and you're not going to make money. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't say the next three years aren't going to be a great move, and you know, you're going to make a ton of money. Sure, sure. So, you know, if we had a market that had consistently losing large sums of money, we would probably exclude it. Um, but 
think about it this way. If it is losing money on a consistent basis, it probably is very uncorrelated to the other markets. So it actually might enhance the portfolio. Absolutely. That, that was the point I was trying to make, that you sometimes have markets in the portfolio for specific reasons. And that is they tend to make money when everything else doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, portfolio development is a huge a huge thing in our industry. Yeah. I, I don't think it's appreciated as much as it should be. No, no, I agree. I want to shift gear on you again um, because I think there's something, you know, that – and this is more towards sort of the, the business side. We've talked about research. We've talked about the models. and But I also think, you know, there's something – uh, important about the business side. You've touched a little bit upon it in terms of culture, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. But obviously, one of the things uh, about Don is that you're also one of the very few firms in our industry that has made a business succession plan that basically takes place over a 10-year period and where you will take full control of, of Don. Um, and, you know, what I wanted to ask you is a little bit different. You know, ownership of a firm, unlike sort of a large institution, do you think it's important that ownership in, in our uh, bis line of business uh, is associated with an individual? Someone where you could say the buck stops here um, and, you know, obviously who are involved in, in the nitty-gritty in terms of the research and product development. Is that important And and um, from your point of view? It's important and done. Yeah. Um, we have a – Bill and I have a saying where done is a democracy, but only one vote counts. <laughs> Excellent. And But, you know, it, it – there's some advantages to that because you're able to act quickly. Um, it also gives everybody a comfort because there's one person they have to look to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, either it's the right person or the wrong person. Um, Bill and I think that so far it's been the right person because, you know, we have a low turnover. People seem pretty happy when they come to work for us. Um, you know, we don't advertise for employees. We basically handpick people that we run across in our lives, either business lives, personal lives or whatever that we think would be a good fit. We bring them in and then we let them figure out how they're going to, uh, help us become more successful. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of the philosophy we've had from the beginning. The transition plan, I think, was tough because when you have somebody like Bill who is self-made and has built such, you know, a successful and well-respected firm, you know, it's part of him. So to pass that on down to somebody else is, you know, it's a real credit to him to be willing to do that. Sure. Um, the reason we chose the 10 year period was, you know, we wanted a transition that would, that would be seamless basically. And Bill and I have worked together for a lot of years. I mean, I came to work in 97. We were working together for almost 10 years before that. Sure. Um, so the, and you know, when I say work together, basically I was brought in as this, as, uh, in the accounting area, but, you know, I was, became the CFO and I also handled all of Bill's personal stuff, uh, at the time. So, you know, we know each other well, there's a mutual respect and trust that goes along with it. Uh, Bill still, when he's in town, he's in the office every day. Sure. And part of the agreement is even after the 10 year transition, he still stays employed. <laughs> now, if we just celebrated his 80th birthday this week. So, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> at the end of the 10 years, he'll be, you know, in his mid 80s. And uh, I suspect that he'll live a long and prosperous life. Everybody in his families, I think, lived over 90. So, yeah, no, I think it's important to, to stay active. I was listening to another uh, podcast with, uh, 
with Michael Covell the other day who had uh, Harry Markovich uh, on and uh, he's 86 but apparently he's committed to a book deal that takes him into another five or six years so I think you know staying active even at that age is uh, probably a good thing that would be a book worth reading wouldn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> now but yeah you know Bill and I are we're three and a half years into the transition and you know things are uh, I think both of us, we would like to have a better environment for trend following, but given that, I think we're doing okay. Absolutely. You put, you, 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 you touch upon another thing, um, which I think sets you apart, uh, to, to a large extent, which is the culture, which is very strong. It's, it's very closed, uh, uh, you know, as a family, as, as you describe. But, but I think another thing that has set you apart, uh, to, to some of the larger, uh, manages is of course that you chosen to be away from from the busy pulse of uh, of the financial centers of the world. Uh, yeah, and that was that was Bill. I mean, he uh, when he left DC, he came to South Florida, and he, you know, as he would tell you, the only thing we require is communications. You know, either by computer or telephone. And we can be located anywhere in the world. Yeah. As long as we have power and communications. We chose, he chose a warm climate, close to water, uh, wanted to be on the East Coast because of the time differences. At the time, he was only trading domestic futures contracts in Chicago. So he didn't want to be on Cal, in the West Coast. Um, so this is where we ended up. Yeah. And we've been here ever since. We we uh, we own our own building at this point, so I don't think we're going anywhere anytime <laughs> soon. But never say never. You never say never. You also have another slightly different approach, um, and that's your fee structure. Um, you know the the, and I guess it goes to the to what you said very early on about Bill maybe wanting to find a, a more honest way. Uh, so. I guess ultimately what you've done is you fully aligned yourself with your investors. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Yep. So we're zero and 25. We don't charge any management fee and our in-house funds probably have the lowest expense ratio of anywhere in the world. Uh, it's usually uh, just a few basis points. The only thing we charge to the fund is the audit fee and the registration fee. Um, so we feel like if the investor's making money, we make money. If the investor's not making money, they don't want to feel like we're continuing to take money out of their pocket. Uh, we think that's the most honest way to do it. You know, if you're just starting out as a CTA, it would be almost impossible to work that way. Um, yeah, we're blessed by the fact that we have a good history and, you know, Bill has accumulated significant net worth and we're able to fund the operations of the company during the bad periods. Um, so there are two things that we feel that are important to investors. One is the fee structure and two is the fact that 50% of the money that's here at Dunn is proprietary money. Yeah, It belongs to Bill and the employees of Dunn um, and we trade, you know, other than the small portion of research money we might be trading uh everything else is traded exactly in the same program that's available to the investors yeah we've touched upon a few times in our conversation the fact that the cta industry is at a difficult juncture at the moment and there certainly are some some challenges out there and 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 uh, it could be interesting to hear a little bit about where where you think your your challenges lie but i i actually wanted to go in a slightly different direction because in, 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 in the 20 plus years that I've been involved, what I've noticed is that it used to be a very U.S. dominated industry. But what's happened in the last 10 years is that a lot of the European managers seem to have sort of taken over and created these massive success stories, I guess, and, and attracted a lot of, uh, of the AUM in the industry. Why do you think that is? What what does these European managers have that appeals to to uh, to investors today? Do you think? 
That's a good question. Um, I don't know that much about the regulatory environment in uh, Europe. Sure. I mean, I can't imagine that it's any better than it is in the U.S. Sure. So then the next thing I have to fall back on is they're doing a better job in, in creating investment vehicles that are profitable. Um, but your performance, it, though, your, but this, this, is this is the interesting point. When I look at these performance records, your performance, you know, uh, says the opposite. And, and, that, right. and in a sense, that leads me to, I mean, this is the thing about, you know, are European managers perceived to be more scientific than maybe the classic US trend follower? Um, you know, I don't see any evidence necessarily that 50 PhDs are better than one or two PhDs, but, you know, may, may, maybe there is, you know, maybe well, perception is just so important. I don't know. Well, the studies have shown that there is definitely no correlation between the number of scientists <laughs> or PhDs you have in performance. That's for sure. sure. Uh, you know, I suspect, or it's, it's my feeling, especially in today's environment is there's much more money being allocated to these types of strategies in Europe than there is in the U S right. And secondly, You know, if you're allocating in Europe, you probably are going to be more driven to allocate to a European manager than you are a U.S. manager. I mean, there there are absolutely concerns from an offshore investor about allocating in the U.S. Sure. And, you know, the U.S. is becoming more and more aggressive in these areas. I mean, their regulatory environment is becoming more aggressive their tax environments becoming more aggressive uh, the political environment is becoming you know less receptive to uh, you know foreign investment and foreign people profiting from things in the US and you know all this is driving you know the investor away um, you know you you see it I mean, this is just the normal function of government and regulatory bodies where they they just overdo it to a point where they drive companies out of business and then they look back at themselves and wonder what happened, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I think we're as good as anybody else out there. You know, there are some European guys that are doing quite well, though, and, uh, you know, they have lots of money under management, I think. 2013, you know, the last four years has been tough. And you know, I think people are taking another hard look at uh, have they really made the right choices or not? Maybe this environment will weed out some of the weak hands. Yeah, no, definitely. Now, the last uh, section I wanted to uh, talk to you about is a little bit sort of a uh, um, outside the normal sort of topics you might come across but i know a lot of people who are listening today are also people who you know aspire to be um you know uh, the next on capital so to speak so just based on your experience um what would you say to them what what does it take to become a great trader or great cta in your opinion well people don't want to hear this but i you know at this point i'm not sure they can't <laughs> um You know, given the, the the environment today, Bill couldn't have done what he did. Right. Um, he would have been in violation of all kinds of regulatory uh, barriers and things that are put in place. Um, you need a lot more capital sure. just to deal with you know, all the issues than you did before. So this is what I would say for somebody starting out. What you need to do is you need to have the trading system or at least the ideas of the trading system that is profitable, that, that it actually accomplishes what your goals are. That is what you need to go around and show people and try to convince somebody to come in and, and provide the capital. Because that's the biggest hurdle to get. If you can get the capital, the rest of the stuff will fall in place. Sure. Um, You know, what we used to do, and we did this with um, 
you know, most recently with Revolution Capital Management out of out of uh, Colorado, who's you know a short term trader. They've been fairly successful. Um, we just separated our alliances here this year uh, because they've grown to a level where they can be independent and function on their own. But what we would do is if we found somebody that had a really good idea, we would bring them, you know, we would offer our services basically and help them provide them capital back office, just resources so that they could actually get a system up and running, but the build a track record and then attract new capital. The regulatory environment that's there today is you really can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, because it raises all these questions and, you know, who's in control and who's doing this and, you know, whether your position should be aggregated and, you know, is this person really uh, competent enough per the regulator to be doing these type of things? So it's made the environment a lot more difficult for the new guy to get help, for the new guy to start out. Um, you, know, you almost wonder if the, where you do, what you do is you go to work for somebody. Yeah. And if you have that independent spirit where you want to break off and go on your own, I guess, you know, maybe that's what you do. Did you, did you personally always know that you wanted to be, because I think it's fair to say that, you know, as a, as, as a uh, CTA, uh, you know, obviously a fund manager, but you're also an entrepreneur. I mean, was there anything inside yourself when you were starting out that said, you know, one day I want to also have that entrepreneurial experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, being a, a CPA, you know, the whole idea of a CPA is to own your own firm or be a partner in a firm. Um, you know, I, I was a partner in a firm before I came to work here. So I think I've always had that desire. Um, once I got involved in the financial industry from an audit standpoint, accounting standpoint, That was by far where my interests lied. Mm. So, yeah, I, I have no regrets about the choices I've made in life, that's for sure. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, Marty, if you could ask a question to my next guest here on Top Traders Unplugged, one of your peers, no doubt, what would you ask them? What are they going to do to differentiate themselves from everybody else in the industry? Because I, I think that's what everybody out there is trying to do right now. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, it's it's definitely a a a, a big theme. So, um, but you know, this has been a um, great conversation. But before we finish, uh, Marty, where's the best place for people to? find out more about Don Capital? Oh, I would go to our website. Um, you know, you can just Google it and come up, but you have to actually register, but it's not a big process. Sure. Uh, you just put in your inf inf uh, information and uh, check off that you're accredited investor and then you get an email with uh, the password to get you in. Fantastic. So that would be the best place to get information. Once you get there, uh, then you can open up a communication, you know, if you have questions or, you know, want anybody to contact you or you're interested in doing anything with us. Yeah, but there's a loads of information on that website for sure. Fantastic, Marty. Marty, thank you ever so much. It's really been great conversation and uh, your story is truly inspirational and I really appreciate your your openness and your willingness to share your insights and uh, and views not just on your strategy and 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 done but also on the industry as a whole so uh, you know and 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 for my part I can say that the listeners can also find a lot of details about our discussion in the show notes uh, uh, for this episode on top traders unplugged And I, uh, I hope and look forward to connecting at a later date and uh, see what other great things you're up to uh, at Don Capital. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure for sure. Thank you so much, Marty. Take care. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. 
If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you, and to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute, and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.